Hi, I'm Jonathan Oxer, and this is Superhouse. If you've looked at consumer home automation devices, you've almost certainly come across the term two-year. But what is it? Most people think that two-year is just a simple Wi-Fi module and maybe an associated app, and they don't really think much beyond that. But to really understand what it is, you need to think about it from the point of view of a company that embeds it inside their products. Now imagine that you have a factory that makes, I don't know, toasters, and you're doing pretty well. You're shipping, say, 100,000 units a month, and then some smart bunny in your marketing department decides that what you need to do is get onto this home automation bandwagon. You need to make your toaster smart, whatever that means. Maybe it tweets whenever you burn your toast, I don't know. But you decide that you want to take your toaster and connect it to the internet and give your customers an app to control it. So how do you go about it? It might sound simple at first, but there's actually a lot involved. It's definitely not as easy as taking your existing toaster design and sticking an ESP8266 in it. First, you have to develop an app, but not just one app. You need them for both Android and iOS. So you have to develop two. And the app can't talk directly to the device. So you need some kind of a messaging API, which runs on servers that you need to keep going 24 seven. You need a user database, of course, and you also need an onboarding process. When a customer installs the app for the first time, you need to add them to the system. And then you need to also do things like password recovery and all of the other user management aspects of it. Then you need a device adoption process. When someone brings a new device online for the first time, it has to be linked into the system. And that means you need a device database and the devices have to be linked to the users because each user could have more than one device. You also need device configuration, which can be pushed down to it and you need to be able to push commands to the device from the phone. But it's bi-directional, so we need to be able to take data from the device and report it back. Users might want to be able to see the state of the device or get data from sensors like temperature sensors. But sometimes there are firmware updates, so then you need over-the-air updates. These need to live on a server somewhere, ready to be installed on the device. You need a process for testing different updates as well because maybe someone's had a device that's been sitting on a shelf for a while and it's several releases out of date. It needs to be able to catch up from previous releases to the current one. Then you need processes like changing the Wi-Fi. What if your customer changes the password on their access point and they haven't updated their device? How do they now connect to it to change the settings so it can reconnect? And what if someone wants to sell it? Maybe they need to do a factory reset so you've got to allow for that as well. And all of this has to be scalable. You might end up with millions of devices online and needing to pass data to them. And it needs resilience. What happens if something goes wrong with your servers at three o'clock in the morning? You need a whole team of system administrators to look after it. You need people on call to deal with anything that might come up. And this is before we've even got to the device that goes inside the customer's product. What you need is some kind of a module that's going to be installed inside it, which will give it connection to the internet and then interface with the device. Now the genius of Tuya is that most of this just goes away. All I have to care about is the module. They pay for the module, build it into their design, and all of the rest of the functionality and the infrastructure comes along for the ride. So instead of needing a team of dozens of people to build all of that infrastructure, it's just an incremental cost. It's two or three dollars per product that you ship. You put the module in and all of the rest of it is taken care of for you. So for a manufacturer of a consumer product like this, it's fantastic. They can focus on designing their own product, integrate the module, and they're done. Tuya make this as easy as possible for device manufacturers by putting a range of solutions online. A manufacturer can just look for something that fits their needs and then tweak it to suit. They support a variety of different radio types, including Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Zigbee, narrowband IoT, and LTE so that it can suit whatever the requirement is of the device manufacturer. For Wi-Fi, they have the WBR and WBLC series of modules. These use chips mostly from Realtek, but they also have one from Beacon. The Zigbee series is the ZS series, which are all using chips from Silicon Labs. You'll probably notice that the module family show both the radio type and the manufacturer of the chip. So the ZS series is for Zigbee and S is for Silicon Labs. Bluetooth are the BT and BN series modules. And narrowband Internet of Things are the NM and NE series. 
Now you may have noticed that none of those modules I just showed you have Espressif chips in them. They don't have an ESP8266 or ESP8285 in the current lineup. Their early modules were based around those chips, but none of the currently shipping modules are. They do still produce those Espressif based modules for customers that have built them into their designs in the past, but for new manufacturers coming along and wanting to integrate to your modules, they don't have them in the range. One of the common things to do as a hobbyist is replace the firmware on a 2U module with something like Tasmoda, which is an alternative firmware that allows you to have total local control. You no longer rely on the 2U infrastructure for it to work. But Tasmoda only runs on ESP8266, ESP8285 and recently ESP32 processors. It doesn't run on any of the processors in the current 2U modules. That means that if you see a product on sale and it says it has 2U in it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can flash it with Tasmoda. You need to make sure that it has one of the compatible modules. The modules to look for specifically are the WE series. W for Wi-Fi, E for Espressif. There is the 1S, the 2S and the 3S module. All of these can be flashed with Tasmoda and then you can take total control of the device. If you are that toaster manufacturer, there are a couple of different ways that you can integrate the module into your product. You can either use direct control or to your MCU integration. If your product is really simple, what you can do is embed the to your module directly into it and it can control your product and also do things like read from sensors. If your product is a bit more complicated and it already has its own onboard microcontroller, the to your module can cooperate with it and act as a gateway. This allows you to design your own custom local logic outside of the to your module. In both cases, the to your module takes care of connecting to the cloud and sending and receiving commands and data. The origin of Tuya reminds me very much of the story of the blacksmith, who heard there was a gold rush. So went to California and instead of digging for gold, became extremely rich by selling picks and shovels to all of the miners. Tuya helps other companies that want to get onto the IoT and smart home bandwagon by providing them the services they need to take their existing dumb products and connect them to the internet. But they're not the only player. If you've bought a Sonoff, it would have come with the eWeLink firmware. That's basically the same thing. eWeLink is not made by IT, the manufacturers of the Sonoff. It's a third party management system, which includes firmware that you can install on your device and the infrastructure and the app that goes with it. What IT do is install the eWeLink firmware and then they don't have to worry about all of that, but they do still have to design the device themselves. The genius of Tuya is that it takes all of that functionality and it wraps it up into a single hardware module that you can build into your product. It takes very little engineering for a product manufacturer to add to your functionality into their device. So if two-year devices are so good, why would we want to replace the firmware on them? Well, there are a few good reasons. One is that here in Australia, at least, we have a problem with certification. Two-year devices are sold fully certified. You can go down to your local hardware store and just buy them. So you don't have problems like we do with the Sonoff, which is not certified in Australia. And so what a lot of people want to do is use fully certified hardware, but then they want to take full control of it. They don't want to use the two year infrastructure and have their device rely on a, an internet connection in order to work. And there are some very interesting devices, things like Wi-Fi enabled power boards, uh, lighting strips, equivalent to the S26 Sonoff. This is a plug-in power socket from Kogan, which has two year in it. And even things like a kettle, this has Wi-Fi so that you can tell it to heat to a certain temperature. But converting these devices isn't necessarily easy. Sometimes it goes very smoothly, sometimes it's really tricky. There are three different ways that you can go about replacing the firmware on a two-year device. Over the next few videos, I'm going to take you through the steps required to take an off-the-shelf, fully certified two-year device and convert it to running Tasmoda, the open source firmware. That way you can take advantage of all of the features of the Tasmoda firmware. You can have full local control. You don't rely on any third party or your internet connection for your device to work. For some devices like this smart plug, we can do a simple over the air conversion. For some devices like the power board, we're going to need to connect to the serial interface on this and flash it with a little programming adapter. And for some devices like this one, which doesn't even have an espressive chip in it, we're going to have to replace the whole microcontroller. That might sound really daunting, but it's not as bad as it sounds. I'm going to show you how to find the right connections and replace the microcontroller so you can take full control of the device. 
Now this video is just part one of a whole mini series which is going to take you through all of the steps of how you can modify to your devices and use them for your own purposes. So stick around, we're going to have some fun.